Welcome to BIV Today, the daily business show from the journalists at Business in Vancouver. I'm Haley Wooden. Thanks for joining us. Today is a historic day. President Joe Biden sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. And joining me on our show today, Mario Canseco, president of Research Co. to offer some analysis. Mario, great to have you on as always. Great to be here, Haley. Thank you. One word that I've been hearing a lot of and reading a lot of today relief. And I'm interested for your perspective on this. How is this Inauguration Day different from Inauguration Days in recent history? Well, I think there's a couple of issues at play. One of them is, I think a lot of people were still hesitant about how everything was going to go today. Uh, we're just two weeks removed from the insurrection, uh, from you know citizens of the United States getting inside the Capitol, uh, chanting things, taking stuff away. Uh, I think there was a lot of hesitation from many Canadians and many uh, all over the world who expected things to maybe not go as smoothly as they did. So there's definitely a sense of relief in the sense that nothing out of the ordinary happened, uh, but also a sense uh, of normalcy coming back to Washington, D.C. Uh, the fact that we have now a commander in chief of the armed forces in the United States, uh, who is not Donald Trump, who has been talking about specific issues that most Canadians care about, such as climate change. Uh, is certainly making Canadians happier with the choice. You know, when we ask Canadians about whether they wanted Joe Biden or Donald Trump, uh, there's definitely a lot of animosity towards Donald Trump that has been consistent uh, since he announced that he was running uh, to become uh, the uh, next uh, head of state in the United States uh, back in 2015. Uh, but there was no embrace of Joe Biden. We still saw roughly one in five uh, Canadians who said, um, that they weren't really sure, you know, they knew that they didn't like Donald Trump, but they weren't really sure about Joe Biden. So it'll be interesting to watch how those numbers shift in the next few months, whether more Canadians embrace what Joe Biden is about, not only because he is not Donald Trump. Yeah, that's an interesting point you raise, because it seems I don't want to say that Biden has it easy. There are many, many challenges. And as he puts it, he's dealing with four crises at once but he's right up next against a four year tumultuous legacy of President Trump. So it's not easy, but he maybe gets to benefit from that a little bit, but how long do you think that lasts? And at what point do we maybe stop comparing Biden to Trump and start analyzing Biden as his own president with his own policies? Well, it'll take a little bit of time. I think one of the issues that we uh, track is the way Canadians feel about other countries and the numbers for the United States hit an all time low in the summer, uh, which is interesting because that was the time when Canada was feeling better about its chances with the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time that we were having the highest approval ratings for the way the federal government and other governments across the country were handling uh, COVID-19, uh, we saw the lowest numbers for the United States. People really disappointed with the way things were going. The exposure that we had uh, to news stories from the United States during Donald Trump's tenure was certainly heavier than anything we saw during the Barack Obama years or the George W. Bush years. Uh, and that enabled a lot of Canadians to sort of look down on the United States because of the way things were going with COVID-19 and because of their choice uh, at the White House. Um, this time, it's a little bit different. We saw a little bit of a shift and more Canadians expressing positive views of the United States after the election of Joe Biden. Uh, I think it'll depend a lot on specific things that happen on the international stage. Uh, there has always been an admiration from Canadians towards presidents who are democratic. Uh, the numbers for Barack Obama were definitely better than what George W. Bush was getting, for instance, and certainly better than what Donald Trump got during his four years at the White House. So the fact that we have a Democrat and we have so many voters in Canada who are more of a center-left mindset certainly bodes well for those numbers to change. But it's ultimately about the way America behaves internationally. And this is something that is going to take a little bit longer to discern. You know, at this time, we definitely know that more Canadians like Joe Biden, certainly more than those who like Donald Trump. Uh, but it'll take a little bit of time for those policies to uh, have an impact on the numbers and the way Canadians feel about the United States. Would it be fair to say our expectations are high, that we are going to return to some sense of normalcy in Canada-US relations? Uh, I would say so. Part of the situation for this is that uh, there was never a scenario under Donald Trump uh, being at the White House where the status quo was palatable. You know, here is somebody who campaigned on getting rid of NAFTA, on creating a new NAFTA, on essentially a lot of divisive policies. 
and there was never an acceptance of what Canada meant uh, for the United States. There was never an official visit. There was never a situation where you had uh, that uh, special bond that has always existed between the two nations recognized uh, by the White House under Donald Trump. Things will be different under Joe Biden, you know, partly because it's absolutely necessary. I think there's an urgency for the Americans to try to reopen borders, even in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are certain issues where certainly Joe Biden's views are more akin to what Justin Trudeau feels about things. So that is definitely something that could work. And it's been interesting because for a long time, we haven't had this combination. You know, we had Barack Obama in the White House. And for a long time, when Barack Obama was there, we had Stephen Harper as the prime minister. So you had this situation where you didn't really have a couple of people from the same political persuasion running the show. Similar thing with Jan Cretin being a liberal, George W. Bush being a Republican. Um, this is new and this is going to last a little bit longer than most of this relationship. So uh, to me, it's certainly reminiscent of what happened uh, with Brian Mulroney and George H.W. Bush in 1988. You know, certain things happened during that time because of the coordination of the two countries and the fact that you had two heads of state um, who were of similar political persuasion. So maybe something similar will happen this time. Right out of the gate, we have seen President Biden move to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline project. Shouldn't have been a surprise, but I think maybe that it happened on day one was a surprise to some in Canada. What do you think that tells us? What insight can we glean from that about how Biden might handle Canada-US issues? Well, this is certainly something that had to happen uh, to appease the base. You know, we heard a lot of comments uh, during the primary season uh, that Joe Biden wasn't really that much of an environmentalist. We never saw an embrace of the Green New Deal that has been discussed for the past few months. Um, people saw Bernie Sanders as a more radical person as far as getting change done at a quicker pace. And I think this is something that had to happen now. If you had to wait a little bit longer to try to deal with something like this, then you lose the opportunity to do something that is going to be meaningful for those who supported you. And you know, there's a lot of people who maybe voted for Joe Biden uh, and they are Democrats uh, who really didn't want him there. You know, it wasn't uh, a, a very uh, easygoing primary season in that sense. You know, he didn't do very well in some of the early states and ended up, you know, becoming the nominee afterwards. Uh, but there was no embrace of somebody from the early stages. And I think this is a way to expand that base and to say to those who are more environmentally friendly and maybe voted for Bernie Sanders or somebody else um, that he really cares about environmental issues. Um, it's a little bit shocking for many Canadians that this happened uh, very uh, early on, uh, but it's not a surprise. You know, this is something that was telegraphed before. Uh, we saw many speeches where he talked about this and he said that this was probably not the right course of action. Um, it's obviously going to be detrimental for the government of Alberta, uh, which is right now not going through a fantastic situation. Um, the NDP is actually ahead of them in the polls. Uh, Jason Kenney's numbers handling the COVID-19 pandemic are the lowest for any um, head of government that we've been looking into right now. So it's more of a problem for Alberta than for the entire country, because there might be ways for Justin Trudeau to spin this differently and to say, well, this is the way the situation is going. And maybe we should be paying more attention uh, to environmental issues and not necessarily to fossil fuels. So uh, it's a bit of a curveball, but it's a curveball that we already knew was coming. And I wonder if this very ambitious climate plan south of the border in some ways makes it easier for Ottawa to fast forward on some of its own climate policies that maybe have been kind of difficult to pursue because of the Alberta issue. What do you think about that? I think it's definitely feasible. You know, we, we go back to one of the earliest environmental treaties that we have, which is the Acid Rain Treaty that was signed by Mulroney and Reagan. You know, there's an opportunity to do something that is going to be more meaningful because there's a definitely good rapport with the other person who's on the other side. You know, we never had that uh, relationship between Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau, uh, not only because they care about different things, but also because there were moments when they weren't really that cordial to each other. Of course, you know, Trump's ability to use Twitter is definitely going to blow up any relationship that he's had. Uh, of course, he can't do that anymore, uh, but it's, it's definitely complicated. And this time around, now, I think it'll be more uh, geared towards specific policies that can be pursued. I mean, climate change is definitely one of them. And 
Uh, I think we're at a stage now where uh, the number of Americans who believe that this is something that has to be dealt with is actually higher than it was 10 or, or 13 years ago. And this is definitely crucial. You know, even when Barack Obama was the president of the United States, you still had about 30, 40 percent of Americans who didn't believe climate change was real. Now the numbers are similar to what we find in Canada. So the appetite from people to act on this and to know the ramifications of our actions in the future is there. What was missing over the past four years was a president and a government that was actually trying to do something about it. So now that those two are there together, um, Canada is going to have an easier time discussing these things than they did before. I've been thinking a lot about Obama in 08 and how he inherited a very different kind of crisis, but the legacy that that left and how that marked and defined his first term. And here's Biden, who says there are four crises, but he's trying to deal with all of them and not just letting his first term be defined by how he manages COVID-19. How difficult is it going to be for him in his first 100 days to make progress on some very complex issues and crises? Well, there's a couple of things that are going to be very complicated. One of them is a vaccine rollout. Uh, it's definitely not as easy as many people expected it to be. I think there was a, a situation where many Americans uh, thought that this was going to be quite simple, that it was just a matter of showing up and getting the shot. And it's going to be certainly more complex than that. Uh, there's definitely an emphasis on how can you sustain uh, the situation that you have right now without making any changes to economic matters. Uh, which is more complex to do in a federation. You know, you see Florida having its own set of rules, Texas having their own set of rules, certain counties in California that are deciding to do things differently. And it's not easy to have a federal mandate for many of these things. Uh, it's a little bit easier now because, you know, he actually believes that this is a crisis and he wants to deal with it uh, certainly at a higher level than what we saw with Donald Trump. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, people are paying attention to the cases. People are paying attention to what is happening. And if in a month or two, we don't see that curve flattening, um, then people are going to start to believe that this isn't the best course of action. And it's difficult uh, to figure out how that is going to go, uh, partly because the cases continue to climb in specific parts of the country. Um, that is one of them. The other one is clearly... Uh, how to reactivate an economy uh, while, being, while making uh, sure uh, that you don't have a higher caseload. So it's definitely more challenging than what we saw with Barack Obama. There are many ways in which you can inject uh, money into an economy and try to uh, uh, essentially get more jobs created uh, when you allow people to be outside their homes. So this is definitely a larger challenge than what Barack Obama faced back in 2008, uh, albeit with the situation that he has right now, which is majorities in the House and in the Senate, provided Kamala Harris can cast that tie-breaking vote. Before I let you go, Mario, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about our federal political scene here in Canada. I won't ask you to predict whether we'll have a federal election this year, but if you have thoughts on the likelihood, by all means share them. But I do want to ask you about the factors that might determine or influence whether we have them. What would you, what are you going to be watching? Well, the one thing that is crucial here is to look at the history of other governments that have decided uh, to hold elections during the pandemic. New Brunswick's government was re-elected with more seats. British Columbia's government was re-elected with more seats. Saskatchewan's government was re-elected with more seats. So in that sense, there's an opportunity to call that election and to make people feel that it's better to stick with the horse that you have. It's not similar to what happened in the United States where Donald Trump did not get that second term because people were dissatisfied with the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, if the election gets called, if the liberal government decides to engineer their own demise, uh, it's going to be at a situation that is advantageous for them. And the key issue here is the vaccine rollout. If we have a situation where a lot of Canadians have been vaccinated, you start to have a sense of more people being able to say goodbye to the COVID-19 pandemic, it'll be a good moment for the government to say, well, this is the moment when we are waiting to get a new mandate from Canadians. Uh, it also helps that um, the leadership of Erin O'Toole from the Conservatives really hasn't been there. You know, we see a lot of Canadians who are still unsure about where he stands. And there's also problems within the, the, within the uh, Conservative caucus when it comes to certain things that they want to talk about. So, you know, you, usually you strike uh, when you feel that your rival 
is at its weakest. And, and, you know, this is one of those moments for them. You know, we haven't seen the traditional bounce whenever a new opposition leader comes into play uh, with Erin O'Toole that we saw, particularly with Andrew Scheer before, uh, or at the time when Justin Trudeau became leader of the Liberal Party. So maybe within the next couple of months will be the opportunity for the federal government to say, this is the moment when we try to get that majority mandate that we couldn't get um, back in 2019. We will see and we'll certainly be following up with you as the months roll on just to get your insights on everything that's happening, but also on that federal political issue. For now, Mario, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Haley. My pleasure. That's Mario Canseco, president of Research Co. I'm Haley Wooden, and this has been BIV Today. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back with a new episode of our show tomorrow.